Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome at Art Laboratory Berlin to our event, uh, our online talk tonight, Controlling Connectivity 10 Years After, um, a talk with Greta Lowe and Igor Strohmeyer. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here online. Uh, our event takes part in context of the Vorspiel Transmediale 2022. And uh, what we do tonight is we want to go back with the first 10 years backwards at Art Laboratory Berlin and our series um, of uh, time and technology that we had started with artist Greta Lowe and um, had a, a series with other artists, for instance, also Sophia New and Dan Velasco Rogers with Plan B, who are with us here tonight. And uh, it was an experiment that we tried 10 years ago at Art Laboratory Berlin to experiment and uh, reflect theoretically and practically about the changes of time, temporal perception through artistic research and practice. And uh, we are so very glad to have had Gretelo uh, starting that uh, series with a uh, breathtaking online performance of 10 days, which actually including the time change in autumn 2011 and endured 241 hours. And this is actually um, a platform, uh, this online performance we wanted to discuss around and through. So basically tonight we wanted to invite you all to also listen to Greta and Igor. Igor took part in a Twitter um, uh, conversation uh, during the 10 day performance. And uh, also we will know about uh, Greta's uh, artistic practice maybe recently. And also Igor will give a statement later on. And we will also invite you later on to discuss with us. So basically it is to look back and to look ahead. And in my tiny little introduction, uh, dear audience, I um, wanted to start with a quote by Greta, uh, 10 years back, basically a little bit more, it was November, 2011, uh, when she described uh, during her online performance, her state of being, she said, it's, it feels like they're talking inside my own head. So the 10 day online performance in November, 2011 forms the fundament and reference point for the project. The parameters were well considered, ex exactingly planned and the temporal framework set. For 10 days, the artist undertook a self experiment in the gallery space at Art Laboratory Berlin in which she completely sealed herself off from the analog world in order to be completely available 24 hours per day. In the virtual world, she brought groceries, supplies with her into the gallery space, and the windows were blacked out to, prelude, to preclude the normal, normalizing effects of sun, sunshine or outside world. Along with the discussions, chat sessions, and other online interactions, the experiment also featured press interviews and scheduled events, which took place at regular intervals throughout the performance and facilitated a steady increase of social and professional pressure on the artist intended it as part of the performance by Greta Lowe. Since the contacts requests originated from around the world, the regular day night rhythm was knowingly and almost immediately dissolved. Thus, as planned, sleep deprivation and the effects of her isolation throughout the performance affected Lowe. So that's only part of a reflection that I formulated for Greta Lowe's artist book uh, 10 years ago. And um, so basically um, the context of our gathering uh, tonight has exactly to do with this uh, really impressive project, uh, Controlling Connectivity, uh, the 24 and one hour durational online intervention. And as we said, uh, Greta made herself available around the clock for contact via the internet. Uh, in this 10 day online durational performance, uh, she explored, and I find this aspect really important, the pervasiveness of internet based social networking. And I'm sure in the course of the conversation tonight, we will be able to discuss this even also on the basis of um, uh, current uh, today's uh, use of internet communication. And not only in the last 10 days it has changed, but radically uh, in the very famous last two years in uh, uh, pandemic times. Uh, so um, 
uh, we would like to uh, structure this, uh, this uh, gathering tonight in the following ways, um, uh, presenting the artists Greta Lowe and uh, Igor Strohmeyer, um, Chris and we will present the artists. Also, we have statements um, uh, by Greta and Igor and uh, very much uh, are looking forward to be taken into the uh, performance project also visually, and then actually also listen to the statement of Igor then we come into a discussion and please, dear audience, um, uh, take notes and um, also um, write questions uh, and uh, collect uh, ideas. So before I hand over uh, to um, Greta Lowe, let me um, introduce the artist. So Greta Lowe is a South African born Australian artist, writer and curator whose practice critically engages advancing technologies and underlying power hierarchies that govern them. Her work has been exhibited widely in institutions and galleries, such as the Row Media Biennale in 2021, or the Honor uh, Fraser Gallery, the Kunstmuseum Solo Tour, or the UNSW Galleries, and uh, Laboral. She has received several awards, including in recent years, an Australia Council Career Development Grant in 2019 and a Visual Art Prize from the city of Munich as well two years ago. Uh, Lowe's artwork and curatorial projects have been co uh, co um, covered by press outlets, including Hyperallergic, Kunstforum, AQNB Magazine, Süddeutsche Zeitung, and many others. She currently lives and works in Germany and Australia, and uh, we uh, full-heartedly want to welcome uh, Greta, and we are so happy to actually meet online tonight in the medium right away. So I would like to give the word over to Greta. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much, Regina and Chris. It's, it's wonderful to be here, and also thank you very much for joining us, Igor. It's lovely to see you. 10 years after we first met, which was during this um, performance. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to some of the sort of many swirling thoughts that I've had uh, about how to think about this project 10 years later and everything that's changed since then. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about the project itself. Um, and I think what I was kind of focused on at the time, what, what seemed most relevant to me at the time. Um, and then possibly we'll get into more of the forward looking things um, in the discussion. So in 2011, um, I'm not sure how many of you can cast your minds back so far, but the discourse around social media and the increasing presence of the internet in, our, in every aspect of our lives was mostly focused around the dichotomy of either demonizing or deifying the digital. So um, one could characterize this dichotomy as essentially being divided along the line of the Arab Spring, which sort of stood for this uh, idealized version of the internet and social media kind of democratizing the world. Um, this idea of, of, of technology as being a democratizing force was extremely strong at the time. And on the other hand, we had the kind of unplugged movement, which was um, picking up speed at that time. And there was this idea of the digital detox that we're, we're kind of seeing um, periodically, even, even today. So on the one hand, social media evangelists were heralding the democratizing influence of widespread distributed P2P communication facilit facilitated by social networks. On the other hand, there was a swell of hand-wringing about what social media was doing to so-called real communication or interpersonal connection, real friends and the social fabric. Now, a decade later, um, a decade during which we experienced uh, the Snowden revelations, the Cambridge Analytica re revelations, we watched Gamergate unfold online, we watched Trump come to power and Brexit come to pass, both of which were campaigns that were heavily influenced by the use of social media or misuse, one could say. And now in the midst of an ongoing global pandemic that has many of us spending the majority of our time online, then you've got the explosion of neural networks, 
it seems as if this deep ambivalence to digital media has become well and truly entrenched and it's no longer seen perhaps as a blessing or a curse depending on one's point of view but as both a blessing and a curse by pretty much everyone in its grip then also we have the boom of cryptocurrencies and their rapid incursion into the art world and we're seeing in my opinion a repetition of the cycle of demonize or deify evangelism and decrying so now going back to the text that I wrote at the introduction of the artist book that came out um, in 2012 after the performance. This question, what the impacts are of the rapid penetration of the internet and online social networks into our daily lives, social interaction, and indeed mindsets was at the root of this project. I wanted to understand by eliminating normalizing factors such as natural light, direct personal contract, contact and interaction, home environment, visual stimuli, and giving myself over for 240 hours wholly to the internet and the people with whom I connect through it, more about the ways in which we were unconsciously, and perhaps to some degrees also knowingly, affected by our, our growing reliance on this still relatively new technology. In many ways, the participation in the elaborate communication networks that now underlie social interaction is no longer a matter of choice, since failure to participate is, in many demographics, akin to social withdrawal. Our decision to connect with and, and performance within online networks also plays an increasingly large role in determining social popularity and professional success. So these statements now, a decade later, feel to me almost like truisms. I, I think now it would be very, I mean, likely that anybody would sort of take issue with any of these but I wrote I remember writing this at the time and I had fresh memories of interactions on Facebook with participants in the performance who um, were arguing the exact opposite and felt that I was um, actually glorifying social media contact by doing this performance at all and I think completely failed to see the sort of critical lens that to me was really central to, to the entire project. So continuing with that text, I wrote, taking all necessary supplies with me, I closed the doors, windows and shutters in the gallery space at Art Laboratory Berlin, completely removing myself from any analog contact with the outside world. And from midday on the 2nd of November to midday on the 12th of November, 2011, I was available day and night for contact over the internet. When there were pauses in communication, I rested or ate or worked on editing the documentation from previous days. But whatever I did, I was always interruptible. I could be awakened at 4 a.m. and asked to comment on complex issues about the project, my practice or media theory. Or it might have been an old friend worrying about the changes in my appearance, speech or behavior over the duration of the performance. So what I remember about, about uh, setting out on this endeavor was that I was concerned with the debate in the psychological community, community and, and the public about so-called internet addiction. But now, you know, 10 years later, I really think what could be the possible relevance of trying to unpick whether there is such a thing as internet addiction when we're in the midst of this global pandemic that has forced almost all of us online for, for huge sections of our, our sort of everyday life. At the time, um, I worked with a colleague at the University of Western Australia um, who measured my psychological well-being um, both before and after the performance. And uh, those, those measures showed that my mental health declined after the performance, but I remember subjectively feeling happier, connected, positive. From what we know now, I would say that this was because social media doles out dopamine hits, but nevertheless, of course, can erode overall well-being. Then again, on the physical plane, during the last couple of days of the performance, um, my speech was slurred, uh, I had trouble focusing. Um, to you, Igor, I wrote many times that I felt dreamy, dreamlike. Um, and I had the recurring sensation that my head was floating several inches above my shoulders. 
and that there was no connection between my head and my body. And these were findings um, that were foreshadowing of things to come in many ways. And I think the way that my practice has developed over the last 10 years has been a sort of ongoing process of trying to come to terms with those. And I think that's where I'll leave it for, for an intro. And I hope that we get into some of these things um, in the discussion. Oh, wait, there is one more thing that I wanted to do, which is read out a little quote of um, a conversation that you and I had via Twitter at the time. So Igor wrote to me, at Greta, I also have mixed feelings when tweeting with you because I know that you have to answer. It's your project concept to talk to us. And I answered, I understand, but me committing to responding doesn't mean the connections can't be useful or interesting for us both, does it? And Igor says, sure, but I'm not actually talking with you now. I'm talking to a project, a concept, an idea, an artwork, not to a person, right? And I said, not at all. The parameters of the project are that I respond to all contact. There are no stipulations about content. And Igor says, but you'll only do it for 240 hours. And after that, then you'll stop being an artwork and you'll become a real person again. And uh, a third participant said, I think the artwork will continue to exist because it will be within sight. It will be within you. You will carry what you learned onto the outside. And I answered, I think the real person and the artwork are coexisting right now. And after 240 hours, I don't know what happens then. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to what you've got to say now, Igor. And thank you, Greta. I'm going to give a quick introduction uh, just to say a little bit about Igor. So Igor Strohmeyer, AKA Intima, is a pseudo internet post artist researching tactical A equals TF squared, intimate guerrilla and low tech strategies. He actually lives and works online only since 1996. Yes, he sleeps and eats in Ljubljana, Frankfurt and elsewhere, but that's a very private intimate circumstance. Among his many projects are Opera, opera Internetica, uh, a series of low tech internet opera art projects, which began in 1998 with Igor Strohmeyer singing HTML source code of his net artworks. It explores guerrilla opera tactics and strategies combined with singing HTML source code, text-to-speech software, JavaScripts, and applets. The series includes Protection en Sécurité, performed in Montpellier in 2006 in collaboration with Annie Abrams, who I believe is in attendance tonight, and the series Valetica Internetica in collaboration with René Zorman, uh, which includes one of my all-time favorite internet performances, Balletica Internetica Part 2 Ballet.net uh, at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. Uh, he's shown in his work at more than 250 exhibitions, festivals, and biennales worldwide, including the Transmediali, ISEA, EMAP, SIGGRAPH, Ars Electronica Future Lab, V2, Impact, Synet Art, Manifesta, File, Stuttgarter Film Winter, uh, Hamburger Kunsthalle, Arco, Banff, Les Rencontres Internationales, the Wrong New Digital Art Biennale, et cetera. And his works are included in the permanent collections of the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the MNCA Reina Sofia in Madrid, Computer Fine Arts in New York, and UGM in Maribor. So we're very happy to have Igor here, who's been, I could say, an intimate part of the project since he got in touch with Greta during her performance. Okay, thank you very much. That was really nice to hear, dear Greta and Chris. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, Regine. Hello, everyone. Well, uh, yes, uh, my story, my personal relationship, my personal story with Greta and her work started in a very intimate way. Um, so basically without without any concept without any thoughts in advance i remember i somehow came upon the project on twitter it was at that time present also elsewhere i think in facebook in what was the thing called google plus right 
So you were using a lot of Google Plus video chats. And, and I also watched some of them. I think they, I mean, pro sometimes they were live. You were like streaming and debating with people and we could join in and just observe. I hope I'm not mistaken, maybe I am. But it was a kind of a voyeur concept uh, as far as I remember. Uh, at that time, so I spent this uh, week, these 10 days, two days, two weeks, and so a bit more than the, the project lasted in Hamburg. I was in Hamburg at that time, not so far from Berlin. And basically, it was a nice situation. I remember it. I came to Hamburg and I was totally alone there. So I didn't know people, actually nobody. Um, so in a way, I was like also locked in my apartment. Of course, I, I, I was allowed to go out uh, to buy some food and to get some fresh air. But I was imprisoned in a way uh, as well. And then I remember uh, somehow finding out about the project on Twitter. I mean, it was elsewhere anyhow. The community is not so big. And then, and then social media was talking about it. That's how I remember it. At that time, I had this courage that I wouldn't have nowadays, probably, to contact you. Uh, uh, today, I would just observe, probably. I, was obser I would observe, I would just like, um, mm -hmm. I would want to know everything, what's happening, how are you, and so on. I mean, if we, if we, if we, um, of course, thinking that, you know, if we wouldn't meet each other before, but uh, at that time, I thought, oops, my sensors were like, okay, live performance, live internet thing, something's happening, but at the same time, very physical, uh, very intimate, very personal, very direct. Uh, that's how I contacted you. I went to read now, I read, I read this, uh, I mean, a little bit now how we started the conversation and so on. Yeah. Um, what I admired at that time, and I still uh, really respect this, was this physical engagement. Your physical engagement into this digital world. Yes, you were digital, you were present all the time online. I think at that time I had a lot of problems with, with the fact that you are always available to us, you know. This was a kind of, a, it raised questions like, okay, so, okay, can we, can we use or abuse or, or how can we interact with you not in a friendly way? Do all people interact with you in a friendly way? Um, do I have to help you somehow, you know, do <laughs> this kind of a, um, you know, this kind of a feeling that, uh, well, when something happens to you online, I have to protect you. I mean, I don't know for what reason, but it was like kind of this, uh, um, yeah. Um, and uh, so what I was really focused on at that time was to observe how you uh, play your role or live your life in a digital world being physically affected by everything that affects you of course because this is a ser serious thing of course you have of course you had some kind of um, you know plan what happens if something goes wrong you had your communications you had your food you were not in the middle of a desert it was probably not a dangerous situation it was i mean probably you know you thought okay everything is going to go well but uh, it affected you in many ways the fact that you were 
awaken all the time, that you had to communicate, that you had to be somehow kind to us. Somehow you had to force yourself also to be kind to us and to be available and to answer all these clever and stupid questions. Um, I, I admired that back then and I, admi I still admire it now, now maybe even more because um, uh, this is a crazy world we, we live in and then, you know, putting yourself in such a position for, for something like this, you need a lot of energy, you need a lot of commitment and you have to be focused. But then I thought, okay, even if you are focused and you were, of course, you were doing, you were, you were doing art constantly 24 seven, you were every movement, every click, every, whatever you were doing, was considered art and it was art of course and then by doing that and by showing almost everything to us of course almost everything you know and it affected your body it affected your way of thinking your your psychological abilities, how to concentrate, how to focus. That was really fascinating to me. And uh, what I was trying to do at that time is to be kind to you, to be kind of, yeah, of course, at that time, I was a little bit more like, you know, um, in this provoking side of, uh, I wanted to like, you know, uh, be a, a, a bit more cynical or ironic but i was consciously putting myself into this kind position i hope i was i mean this was my great wish uh, when i read when i read now back what i wrote i think i didn't cross the limit which is okay so i stayed in this very positive this was my role let's call it a role let's call it i put myself in a role in a way you did it as well, but you did it much more physically and much more 24-7. Um, uh, I wanted to play this role. What I didn't want was to, you know, I said at the beginning that my sensors uh, activated themselves because I saw you in my territory. But when I say my territory, you know, I, I mean, was like online performance. I never did anything durational as you uh, did. I also don't know, Annie Abrahams will tell us later, hopefully, but I don't remember her durational performances in such a way. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong, who knows. Um, so this was absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, so this was my position. My role was to communicate, not to patronize you, not to uh, say, aha, we have a new kid in town and let's see, you know. Um, and then maybe to conclude slowly, this is exactly the position that is really hard to take nowadays. And that's why I think if it happened today, I would probably observe and not actively interfere with your actions because I would feel more comfortable. Uh, I would feel more comfortable by just, you know, Andy Warhol once said, I don't know exactly, I can't quote him directly, but something like that he wouldn't mind not being invited to parties or whatever. It was really important at that time. But if he could observe or watch every party through his television, I think this would be my perfect position nowadays. Um, um, at that time I had a lot of fun a lot of fun I was thinking of you not only when writing or tweeting 
and interacting, but also when I was outside, you know, uh, when, when I, not in a way, oh, poor Greta, now she is locked there and I'm here. I didn't have this kind, this, this, this kind of intimate relationship, of course not. But you were always on my mind. <laughs> and that's true. Uh, because I thought you are in danger somehow. And then I thought, okay, so you have to, you have to um, think about what she's doing and how she's doing, and you have to uh, keep her in a good spirit. I mean, to talk, I was not the only one. That's good, you know. It was not my responsibility. You were not. I mean, I was not responsible for you. That was really perfect. Otherwise, it would be really terrible. Um, so that's how I remember that time. Uh, Sorry, that, Pedro, can I can I answer a couple of things? Please do it. Please do it. Said. So I've made notes. Um, so one thing that you mentioned early on was this idea about uh, you know possible abuse, what can happen online, um, and the feeling of you know wanting to protect me. Um, I remember at the time you called me once the Joan of Arc of the internet. <laughs> Do you remember that? And um, I've thought about this a lot. But the, the thing was, um, I spent a year um, volunteering for a suicide prevention telephone counselling line when I was, I don't know, 19, something like that, 20. And... Um, that is a kind of a similar experience in a way because you have people reaching out to you for all kinds of different reasons. And some people are reaching out for genuine reasons because they have issues that they want to discuss, that there are things going on. I mean, I think everybody that calls you has issues, but some people mostly, well, in, exclusively men in my experience um, would reach out for, you know, like various forms of coercive sexual interaction on the phone and things like that and so I had had a lot of experience with that and I really honestly expected that going into this especially being a woman going into this space um, and I have to say that I was really surprised that that did not happen very much at all um, but there there were interactions it's step documented um, in the in video form and in the book as well, that there was uh, one person that reached out to me who really wanted to get me into Second Life. And then he um, created this avatar for me, which was incredibly sexualized and wearing a very kind of revealing outfit. Um, and then, you know, he was very suggestive in the way that, you know, he introduced me to the platform and the way that, you know, he had our avatars interact and all of this kind of thing. And that led to a whole other really interesting um, line of work in my practice after this project, looking into the way that we identify with the avatars and, um, you know, the kind of psychological mechanisms behind that. But I, I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, firstly, I was prepared for a level of abuse of the parameters of the project. And for some reason that didn't happen. I wonder whether that might be more likely to happen today. Um, the other thing that I wanted to set straight was that I don't believe that the project was at all voyeuristic. And the reason I say that was because, I mean, there were actually people who asked, um, you know, can they see a live feed of me or something online? And I said, no, that's not available. And there's a reason for that. It's not supposed to be voyeuristic. There were also people who wanted to know if they went past the gallery in bedding, whether they would be able to see me. And I said, again, no, it's not, it's not a fishbowl. It's about the interaction. Um, you also mentioned this idea of kindness and that I was being very kind. And um, there were actually also no stipulations in the performance that I should be that way. So I suppose I was thinking while you were talking that maybe it's, just my personality <laughs> or you could also say and I think this is relevant to the the sort of abuse question um you could also say that it's a form of camouflage you know that it's a kind of uh coping mechanism that women use in public spaces in in dangerous in quotes 
dangerous situations. Um, probably some combination of both, yes. <laughs> Greta, I remember a couple of years ago, it's not a long time ago, uh, that uh, when you were taking some photographs, some pr uh, profile photos or, or photos in front of your uh, artworks and so on, and then you specifically wrote something wonderful. You wrote that you are trying to make a photo where you would look like you without this phony smile that usually women have when they take selfies or whatever. I don't know. I forgot now how exactly it was. You remember? No, and then, but... Oh, come on. That you I, I, I want don't. to look more serious. Yeah. Well, and then you took I a serious, you, yeah, you took a series of photos that yeah. were really great because you were uh, standing in front of your artworks and looking straight into the camera, something like that. Yeah. It was a statement. This was a statement. And that's, yeah. that was great. I, I found it great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, as a, as a, a female artist, um, I have many times encountered situations where a photographer is there to document a number of different artists and uh, um, they will ask the, the women to smile and the men are not asked to smile. And it, I've, I have, yeah, at one time I can remember I was in London and I, the, the photographer was really insistent and I asked him, of course, it was a male photographer. I asked him um, whether he asked the men to smile as well. And uh, he was very defensive about that. And then, you know, sort of made some joke or something. And then I guess my reaction to, to sort of soothe the conflict of that moment was then to laugh. And then when I laughed, he immediately snapped the photo and then said, thank you very much. I'm done now and, and took off. And so of course, at the end, the photos were the male artists, serious, not smiling, no teeth. The photo that was published of me was the one in where I laughed to disarm this conflict that we'd had over the, the fact that I didn't laugh or smile. So it is something that happens a lot. But, you know, it, it brings us back to what you were saying about you were, you found yourself playing a role. And I think this is so fascinating because I there was nothing in the performance that allocated roles to any of the participants. And you were, in fact, completely free to interact with me however you chose. And I, I think that, you know, it's it's funny that that you then defined a role for yourself and it became quite conscious, actually. And, um, you know, I think that happens, I don't know, I mean, it's there's a lot of that going on, of course, now with the sort of uber professionalization of social media and the way that people become a kind of brand. Um, and, you know, are, are constantly trying to perform this brand in some visible way. Um, but I think what you're talking about is, is before all of that, it's really about a kind of, uh, yes, it's a, about a kind of intimacy. And you've defined the details of that relationship in some way. And your role is defined in relationship to the interpersonal connection. Yeah, there is something I would like to say uh, right here now you see it was a kind of strange thing because i knew you are a real person but we didn't know each other mm -hmm. and so you were totally real but at the same time you were not <laughs> i don't know how to describe it you were oh, it's right yeah. you were something on the internet something online but this something, of course, was a living being, was a, a real person. And, but this person was, let's say, far away, locked up somewhere and so on. I didn't know much about you. Uh, I started to, you know, to do the research because it looked very interesting to me what you're doing and so on so it's of course then you you uh, then i started to build a kind of a picture bigger picture about you mm -hmm. but 
But at the same time, I was communicating with, with I don't know what that is actually. This is a kind of a, yeah. It was a second life outside of a second life, of course. Huh? And it was all via text. I think during that time, you and I only yeah. communicated by text. We never spoke. And actually, there was another interesting quote because I was, of course, in contact with Chris and Regina the whole time on a daily yeah. basis. They, Regina particularly, I think, was required some um, convincing in the beginning because she thought that it might be dangerous, actually, for me to spend that much time doing that. And she would check in on me <laughs> regularly. Yeah. And there was a, a lovely moment where Regina referred to me as a virtual soul. But I said that I was like this kind of virtual soul, you know, this uh, connection point in a, in a virtual world. And you responded to this, Igor, and said, you're just an illusion, a computer algorithm, a flow of data. You're too artful to be a virtual soul. That's it. That's, I still believe in this. Yes. And I also needed some distance from, I, I needed this distance, this Twitter distance. I needed this distance in order to get closer to you. But then you said that you would, that I kept kind of coming into your mind during this time when you were doing other things. Why do you think that it, why did that performance hook you on that emotional level so much, do you think? Yeah, it was really, it was such a fascinating thing. It was um it was a, a story that i followed online and then it became yeah then we started to talk more and more um and i and and, and also maybe it's related to, to 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 what i said before that i was in a city where i didn't know anyone mm. i was completely alone and I mean, I had my family, of course, but outside of this bubble, there was no one. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and this probably has, has, uh, is relevant uh, to, 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 the, to, whole, to the whole context. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, and then having these parameters like online performance, nonstop online, uh, live and so I mean yeah live chats uh, things happening um, I think when you put all these things together you get um, yeah then, then it's maybe easier to understand how, uh, so why it affected it I have to I'm tell gonna... you a little um, a little story of uh, a moment that was really affecting for me and it happened, I think, a year before this performance. And I remember I was in Berlin and I was sitting in my bed and there was a, um, a performance, an online performance artist in New York who was doing a performance. Um, not one that I even found particularly interesting, but it was a live, there was a live interaction with Twitter. And basically you could send a tweet to him and um, it would steer his actions. And I was fairly new to Twitter and I was following this project and I sent him a tweet and and there was a there was a video that you could watch at the, at the same time and I was watching the video and he immediately read my tweet and carried out the action. And I know that seems so banal today, but at the time it really it, it felt like some kind of strange omnipotence, you know, that I could like reach through the computer and affect an action on the other side of the world. And I became really, really interested in this. And actually that performer um, a few months later was doing a performance in uh, Berlin. And it was also a durational performance for three days. Uh, there was a networked element to it. And I, uh, he had made it public where he was performing and said that people that were in the area could go and see. So I went there to see him and I had brought uh, gifts and things like that. And I turned up and um, he was sitting outside, like not doing the performance in a durational way, like smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee with um, other people from the neighborhood. And I remember, you know, I was so outraged. You know, I really was very idealistic when I went into this, into controlling connectivity. I really felt like if I say it's going to be durational and I'm really going to do this the entire time, then I absolutely will. And I, that was a kind of, you know, 
anti-role model for me of exactly what I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be that person who says they're going to do something and then on closer Mm. inspection, it's something else, you know? So just mentioning that because you also spoke about like the durational nature of the project. And so I think, you know, I really had an example of what it means to kind of set yourself up as something and then disappoint people. So you were very consequent in everything you were doing. And uh, another very important thing uh, in, in this context is also that you, whatever you were, I don't know, writing, talking about and so on, as far as I remember, or as far of, you know, this, what I got, this, this, what came to me, so I can't say for for all the days because maybe you know, was very consequent as well. So you were you were not uh, you didn't go out of this of this concept that you had at the very beginning or how you planned everything. You stayed within this uh, strong. Uh, uh, concept uh, your plan executing things day by day of course you were talking to different people online and i wasn't for sure not following all the conversations because i could i could not but uh whenever we talked and we talked quite a lot um there was never anything that would upset me or disturb me or that I would say, come on, Greta, what are you talking about? Why is it now? Why are you going in this direction or whatever, this kind of thing. So I was always inside this uh, zone where I felt, wow, yeah, cool. I mean, really, she's, she's staying on the line. She's going forward. She's, you know, like this is important. I never lost you in sense of, but oh, I think no, that's no. also because the line was so simple, you know. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah, exactly. It was exactly. really just just be present. That was it. Exactly. It was. That's I had it. no. I had no content, and I think Chris has a question for us. Yeah, yeah. I was going to. Um, that's true. You well, you approach this. I think not only from performance, but also from psychology. You yeah. you coming from psychology, so you even phrase that in in the book where you say, you know, how is the internet changing us? And it's certainly also a moment in it seems so long ago because we've become so, uh, you know, especially in the last two years, but sort of over the last 10 years. So uh, I don't know, on one hand drawn into the internet and it's become such a banal part of everyday life. On the other hand, we've lost a lot of that. Um, you know, Igor is here talking about how he felt the kind of solidarity and responsibility for you, even though he'd never met you. You know, maybe just as in one internet performer from the first generation and then another one in this new emerging social media at the time. And, uh, you know, now 10 years on, and especially after two years of everybody, you know, kind of having periods where they were almost totally online or communicating online instead of in person. Um, one thing I think that's it's been lost to a large degree is this sense of solidarity, especially outside of one's immediate circle of, of not on, not Facebook friends, but real friends that one man just keeps in touch with, but outside of this, uh, you know, kind of blood circle of people. Um, you know, you're you're cold, you're distant, you don't have solidarity. Even Igor is saying that he probably today wouldn't have gotten involved. He would have just watched. Uh, and so what does that say about how the internet has changed us, about maybe about our collective mental health? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know, on one level, I totally agree with everything you're saying. On another level, um, I have to say that there have been really different experiences for me too. I mean, I recently went to Los Angeles for um, an exhibition and, you know, in advance of going there, I was, you know, looking at my Instagram contacts and everything. I have to say for the record here, Instagram didn't exist at the time that we did this performance. You know, that's, that's how much things have changed. And now Instagram is almost unavoidable for artists and most artists would consider it to be a really central tool to their, you know, the sort of uh, business side of their practice. Um, And 
so yeah, I was looking at my contacts and things like that. And I got in touch with a couple of people that uh, lived there. And um, one woman, another artist who I'd never met in person and, you know, we probably followed each other for a couple of years and had some contact via message and things like that. And um, she mentioned that she wasn't going to be in town at the time. She was visiting family and offered that I could stay at her place, you know. And this is, this is, these things are still happening now. And I, I find it kind of gobsmacking, really, you know, that this person, as you're saying, uh, as you said, Igor, this stream of data, this sort of uh, Turing test algorithm that you're interacting with via text online and seeing these posts that they're posting, that this is a real person who lives in this real city that I'm really going to, that I've never been to, and who offers me their real, a real roof over my real head, you know? I mean, these are things that um, still are possible. So I don't know. I mean, I think there is something to be said for community building. Um, I know, for example, the, the kind of NFT evangelists talk a lot, love to talk a lot about community building and what that means. Um, so if you want to be sort of more critical, more cynical, you know, there is a lot of misuse of the term community, um, you know, kind of taking it outside of that, you know, way of thinking in terms of community building and kind of political agency and all that kind of thing and taking it more towards, you know, basically accumulation of capital and a kind of financialization of, of, uh, community um but yeah i mean i think there is still there is still solidarity online it's just maybe um maybe our ways of finding it are different i'm not sure maybe we're more uh, skeptical before we get into it i'm not sure there's there's certainly a, it feels very different, but when I think about it, I can find examples of solidarity that are happening still. I, I just wanted to also like um, enter the discussion and actually thank you, Greta and um, Igor, for for your statements and uh, um, recalling basically what is now already more than ten years uh, in the past. And as Greta said, a whole uh, world, or maybe many worlds, have happened since. And our attention, our mode, our use of the internet has radically changed. Uh, but I would also uh, like to, to to further discuss if the if this dichotomy of um, deifying or uh, um, uh, or um, like a radical rejection is actually still uh, existing. But what I found interesting actually in the, the statement today, Greta, and I also would like to, to dwell on that, that's why I still find this performance from 2011 so meaningful even today. Uh, first of all, I have to say, also coming from a curatorial and also like a, a, a theoretical uh, point of view, you, 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 um, you framed and you, um, you, you parked and you you planned your um, and, and and carried out your performance so uh, attentively in the in the terms of you actually even were celebrating your 30th birthday in the performance, meaning to create a highly personal event and trying out uh, it, it physically experiencing basically how it is actually to, to create emotions uh, uh, on a virtual level. And I also remember you had these uh, regular uh, Google Hangouts and uh, we tried through all the time, through all the time zones to create interviews for you to keep you awake. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then actually you timed it. And I re remember I was, I was writing uh, for the artist book uh, in it that you do you really attentively carried out four formats. So there was the performance, there was 11 days after the end of the performance, there was already the exhibition. And then there was the artist book. And then you actually, as if we could say, paid tribute to the format of the internet, you created a project website. So basically in the medium you answered in, a, in an archival way to, to, to place results, uh, snippets, uh, uh, gifts, uh, for, uh, that was also very new at that time. Um, <laughs> and, um, and one thing actually, um, uh, we come back to talk about the internet nowadays, but just 
one thing what really blew my mind and I'm so happy we have this work here in Berlin is um, I just wanted to, 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 to share this with the audience here is actually the, the mouse movement, uh, the mouse rollover. And it is actually, when you talk about the duration of time and spending time in the internet, I don't know if I can uh, uh, share this uh, with everyone. Um, um, maybe I can just quickly share my screen. And I wanted to share this with you. Can you see actually uh, my browser? And um, you see the work mouse movement, yeah? So, so, so what was that? And I was so struck. And of course, now I argue actually from an odd theoretical point of view, but actually it was part of the whole project. And I gladly reflected on it and I found it amazing. What do we see here? So first, maybe we might think it has... Actually, it looks like a Tashi's painting from the 1950s, abstract movements, uh, lines, abstract uh, drawings of circles, uh, black parts, not black parts. So, but actually it is, um, uh, in fact, the piece is a graphic representation uh, of the artist's computer activity during the 10 day online performance, which was stored by the IO graphic software over the entire time of the performance. So it's the mouse movement. So um, in this way, the performance document becomes a drawing, which due to the large scale is viewed almost as though through a microscope. This is interesting coming from Art Literature Relief 2022 perspective, talking about microscope. And the larger circles represent longer pauses in the movement of Lowe's mouse, while the lines document all the movement of her cursor throughout the entire 24 and one hours. One can read the print as a temporal distillation of the performance. Lowe's work at her computer sets the mouse in movement and the chosen software translates these physical acts of communication into an abstract drawing system dictated by algorithms. The accumulation of lines and symbols is a visualization of the performance, a translocation of code. What initially appears as a palimpsest of time past dissolves upon closer viewing into individual pixels. The illusion of a drawn line is in the end undermined by its digital counterpart. So I was just really struck with it. I mean, because it doesn't show you as portraits and I find it interesting, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Igor, you, you uh, um, uh, emphasized also the way that we see Greta as portraits. And of course, Greta also very uh, 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 playfully uh, took this uh, into your performance and also into the outcome of the performance. Um, and also in the, in, the, in the artist book, there is, um, there is constantly, uh, uh, you play with the portraits. But then this, this palimpsest here of, of, of mouse movement it's it's space. It brings us back actually to the the, the zero and the one, and uh, in, into algorithmic uh, worlds. I, I just found it interesting. But nevertheless, it's it would and, be great to come back also with our audience to 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 and just, to, just yeah. Do, 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 do. Uh, uh, briefly, just briefly, and it looks really uh, similar to Greta's current work, right? Doesn't it? <laughs> You know, oh, like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, come on, you know, it doesn't. Of course, I understand it's not the same thing, but it uh, it has this, uh, you know, these kind of structures, these kind of circles, and uh, and it, it reminds me somehow uh, of um, of uh, the images that I'm now seeing uh, in your Instagram account and everywhere. Oh, of course, nice. there are colors; it's different in in mm. and so on, but but. Um, you know the circles and uh, you know these round things and you know of course now there are these animals and yeah creatures well, no? i mean i think where you're right probably is that you know i think you know hit the nail on the head too when she said that that brings it back to the zeros and ones because of course that piece is really probably the only piece from the entire performance and the documentation that sort of visually uh, and conceptually documents, maps, presents the performance um, in, in a kind of quantifiable way. 
rather than a, a qualitative way. It's it's about the the quantified self, the quantified self online, this kind of quantifying of our time online. And then I think because of all these, this sort of network of lines, this web of lines, um, it feels very relevant to a kind of digital aesthetic that we've become familiar with. And so from that point of view, I would say that it's definitely relevant to my current work because I realized in the years since doing this performance, you know, at that time, I really felt that I was interested in digital networks and in the net as a network. And I realized over the last, probably the last four, four or five years or so that actually what I'm interested in is systems and networks in general. So, you know, equally, and I think in some ways it probably mirrors some of the, um, you know, work that Art Lab has done since then as well, but, you know, I'm, I'm as interested in, root systems as I am mycelium networks, as I am digital networks, as I am social networks, you know, both in the sense of people, but also in the sense of, you know, the platforms online um, and kind of ecosystems as networks and, and all of the ways in which these kind of larger sort of system thinking, webbed thinking, um, how that is impacting the direction that we're kind of heading in. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because uh, I was also wanted to bring this up uh, to say, let's talk about the non-human on the web. Uh, on one level, uh, Igor was challenging you and even saying, you know, are you a person or are you a project, a concept, an artwork? Uh, but going beyond that, um, certainly back then, even then, bots uh, were becoming better and better at impersonating humans, but now there are such an everyday part that you don't know if what you're interacting with is a human or a bot, and you kind of just take them as, as the avatar they are, uh, which could be then would be either. And it's not only software robots, but I would say you have human robotniks to play with around with right. Carl, Chucky, Burn, uh, such as the human workers in troll farms yeah. uh, who are playing parts of scripts or, you know, who's to say they aren't combinations here? Troll centaurs, troll bots, you know. Um, social media has gone from bringing uh, humans around the globe together who might share common interests to bring it together humans and machines who share diverse dreams, nightmares, and conspiracy theories. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure these are also ideas that, I mean, probably even going back into the 90s, this idea of working with, uh, uh, with coding and software and then seeing how where that goes uh, and interacting with the software as a co-performer on the part of Igor uh, and, you know, and uh, was it, and, but th these are all also questions that connect into the idea of, of human intimacy when uh, suddenly you're being intimate with a non-human and maybe you're aware of it, maybe you're not aware of it. And sometimes I have been feeling more and more in the present day, people don't really care. It's just kind of part of the game. And probably after a while, after, I don't know, two, three, four, five days, Greta was not Greta anymore because of her phys physical condition. So she was not the same Greta as she was at the very beginning of the performance. She was uh, under strong influence. You were under strong influence of everything that happened to you during that time, not just that you were not sleeping enough and so on, but everything you had to do. So it changed also your role, your position into a kind of more robotic or whatever kind of, because after a while you probably also figured out how to survive. You saw some light at the end of a tunnel and you said, okay, if I behave like that and like that and like that, if I do this and this and this, then it will be easier for me to survive. Was it a kind of a, is it, is it relevant what I'm saying? Because, you know. I don't, I don't know if I, I don't think it was like that. I think um, I was just very engaged in it. I don't know. I can't say it in a different way. I was just very engaged in it. And actually maybe that's true of how we engage with social media now that, you know, there isn't, in this kind of constant flood, um, there isn't really this sort of moment necessarily to stop and uh, consider it in a different way or to, to ask what the end goal is or to ask, you know, how, how are we going to survive in some way? Um, 
I, I certainly didn't think about that at the time. You know, I'm not normally a person who's very good at living in the moment, although I, I try and I'm, I'm getting better. But, um, uh, but at that time, I think I really was. I really was just in the moment. And it was just sort of um, each interaction came one after the other and they were all sort of interesting. But I think, Chris, what you were saying, I mean, I really relate to that. And, you know, the way that I talk about the work that I make now is really that, you know, one of the kind of central or perhaps the central theme is that I'm, I'm interested in looking at the ways that the technosphere and the biosphere interact and the kind of friction that's created between those. And, and that's exactly what you're talking about. You know, it's like all of the kind of human and non-human systems on the earth, the biological systems on the earth and how they're being interacted with and impacted by and how they in turn are acting upon the technosphere that we've created, which is also this sort of equally massive complex network of AI, robotics, you know, networked tools, digital communication, all of these kinds of uh, technological developments that we've, that have, have kind of come together in a way that is not, I believe, intelligent at all. I don't believe that artificial intelligence in the way that it's described exists, but I, I do think that, um, that they've become so complex as to be unshut offable somehow and and there I mean there, there there's so many systems that are working together that it becomes almost autonomous because of the complexity of it I was interested in with machine learning is, is how it I would say it has its subjectivity which is just basically uh, how it runs through the computation through the um, through the information it's given through the, the uh, uh, you know so the input, you know, leads to the output, and it's not necessarily what the humans are intending it to be, because inside that block black box, it's not, it doesn't have the context. They, you know, context is removed. Uh, a translation, uh, machine learning translation uh, system doesn't have you know, benefit by having con ling context, linguists, and so on. It benefits from just doing the computation and being rewarded or not rewarded, and then until it finally does it better than humans would do it. Uh, you know, so it, it's interesting is, uh, is exactly how things come out that are not, for uh, our society is, is projected all this uh, perfect um, object, object, objective results of, of AI. And I don't see that. I see all these subjective, you know, could yeah. be the, the innate racism or sexism that comes from the results, which is not necessary part of the machine is just part of the, the garbage that's fed into the machine the data set yeah yeah sure uh, i just uh, I, to offer also for the audience to put questions or actually um also to to come up and and, uh, and mix in um uh, Here's a question. I, I read it uh, from Magdalena. Thank you. I would like to thank you all for the great panel. I wonder how do you feel about Facebook's metaverse as a space of possible and actual violence against women and children? Do you think technologies worsened how people behave online or is a mere extension of behaviors happening offline? So this question was one that um, that I addressed specifically at the time of the performance um, with Dr. Leon Tan, who's a psychologist, and uh, there were various other um, experts from the psych field who spoke on these matters. And basically the consensus, and I think this remains the consensus, is that the internet and this kind of perceived anonymity, or um, even as Igor was saying uh, at, at some points, obviously with a very different um, intention, but you know this kind of distance, um, that it can act as a disinhibitor, that basically, uh, you know, this perception of distance or anonymity or protection somehow, or the perceived unreality of the person that you're talking to does encourage uh, more extreme versions of the behavior that we would have already been predisposed to. Um, and there, there are other disinhibiting effects um, or, or substances that can, can have disinhibiting effects, but it doesn't sort of supplant one personality with a new personality. That being said, I think that 
um, since, you know, as I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, over the last decade, we've seen a huge, absolutely, you know, kind of light years um, shooting development of culture online. And I think maybe it is possible to say now that there are, you know, subcultures that exist online that actually don't really have a parallel in physical space. And, you know, I'm thinking about the rise of the alt-right, um, the way that Gamergate was really cultivated um, by, of course, offline actors, but, you know, um, it was cultivated and kind of took on a life of its own, was channeled into the Trump campaign and the Brexit campaign and continues now in various forms. And, you know, I think that there is a there is a kind of evolution of culture happening in those spaces as there always is when people are intently um, interacting with one another. I think there's always going to be a kind of evolution of cultural norms within those tight knit groups. And it does seem to me as though that is happening in this kind of distributed sense online uh, amongst certain groups and that then they begin to, um, to develop new norms amongst each other, amongst themselves, you know, which um, possibly do supplant norms that uh, ex have existed or do exist in the physical world. But then, of course, we also know that those behaviours that might be cultivated in, in one space, like in an online space, eventually bleed over into the offline space too. So, you know, I do think uh, that there, there are very porous boundaries there. Um, and... Yeah, Igor, do you want to tackle the first part of that question? What do you, how do you feel about Facebook's metaverse as a space for possible violence? Uh, thanks for reminding me about the first part. Well, I mean, you have said it all. This is really important. Uh, I agree with you, absolutely. Uh, it is getting worse and worse. Um, the Facebook is a terrible place. Uh, I, um, it depends how you use it. Of course, you can limit the danger very much, but uh, unfortunately, it's really hard. You have to be really strict if you want to stay safe. Um, I still believe that it's possible, but then you have to be completely... Uh, you have to go out of this kind of personal use, usage, uh, and this is very hard for, for people to do because it's meant, meant for a personal thing. Uh, and uh, um, here, maybe I would just uh, remind us all, we know about it, this is nothing new. Um, how was it at the very beginning <laughs> when the internet was understood as a really free and totally, um, free space uh, I, where I, the ideas could be shared. It was a kind of a utopian, democratic, chaotic, anarchistic as well space. Uh, and that was at the, the time before the social media, of course, and how everything changed now because of course it's privatized and when you say the internet, you actually mean Facebook or Google or whatever. Uh, the, and how important it is to support initiatives and, and, and real actions happening all over the world to construct parallel networks, uh, servers which are more or less independent, communication structures. So actually we need another internet that will function a bit different and maybe this will help us what we have now is of course very dangerous and that's normal because it's it's um, it belongs to private corporations and that's yep. why it's really dangerous I, when i was preparing i was taking some notes and i was thinking about this of course very much because you're someone who's really been involved in doing creative uh, actions in the internet really from the 1990s. So someone who uh, was thinking about how a medium that at that time didn't have video, didn't have live action could be used in a performative way. 
uh, and you know you had to also to come towards it with a way of, of learning how to code and how to kind of take really primitive apps and hack them and, and kind of squeeze them more than they were meant to be used. And as the internet developed, then you know you were able to take advantage of of the first video technologies uh, for streaming and so on. Uh, and so you, in this way, you are really someone who has been there from if maybe not the beginning of the net, but almost the beginning of the World Wide Web and certainly the, the, the early days of performative. And then uh, uh, you know, the so-called Web 1.0, and then um, with Greta as someone who whose work with the internet comes in with trying to deal with this whole idea of social media, the good and the bad, the possible, the impossible uh, of Web 2.0. Uh, actually, a really interesting note I had is that you know we all have been on Zoom these last few years. And I can't remember, outside of that bizarre adventure in Second Life, one of the most dynamic parts of that performance was uh, Google Plus Hangouts, something that existed for a short time. I think it had just come into being a few months before the performance and then doesn't exist anymore. It died out uh, not too long after the performance, but you found this community there that was really vibrant. And it was a really interesting medium and it really had potential. And I was, was thinking like, you know, what if we had had, uh, what if the pandemic had taken place in 2012 or 2013? We would have all been using Google Hangout. Maybe we would have had a different pandemic, it would be an interesting idea. Um, but now we're moving into this, there's this new hype of this so-called Web 3.0. It's a kind of a term that makes me cringe. Um, it sounds somehow, you know, they've got a democratization of handing back your privacy. Uh, in a way that 99% of the people using it don't understand. I mean, it's basically, uh, it, it comes across at least to me, like it's uh, uh, almost a scam or it's it's a uh, financialization uh, for the few who control it and then they're selling it uh, very unconvincingly from my point of view as, uh, as handing back to privacy, handing back to, uh, democracy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know, beyond those, ugly, even silly ecological disaster devices known as NFTs. Uh, do you, either of you see any opportunity in crypto or any of these associated structures or, you know? It depends uh, how much money we are talking about. Uh, uh, no, look, uh, uh, I mean, interesting debates, of course, it's wonderful to follow this, but in order to even think of web three first we have to agree if there is something like web two i don't know i mean um, uh, you know how to define these changes and these borders where where does web one end and then starts the web two i don't know maybe we don't have maybe maybe web two is not doesn't exist maybe this is a kind of a corporal invention i think i read a similar tweet somewhere if i recall correctly i don't know um you see this is a question of money this is a question of how much you earn so you have people i know personally artists who earned a lot of money with nf with the nfts i'm talking about um tens of thousands of euros uh, real people, you know, from, from Berlin, from your city. So it's not an abstract thing for them. They, they bought an apartment. They, they really improved their <laughs> financial status. Uh, and this is real. This, this was real money. Of course, it comes from the NFTs and, and, and everything terrible you mentioned about the NFT. Uh, I mean, stand, this is correct. But for them, uh, this was really like a lot of money. I'm not talking about some abstract people, artists in the United States that we just read about them. No, these are our neighbors, actually. No? Uh, so, I mean, I mean thanks, man. And, then, I yeah. and then you say, okay, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Well, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I do know. Of course I know. It's bad. It's really bad. <laughs> okay, so this is 
This is great because this brings us back to the beginning where I said that actually I think that we are seeing again this same debate about demonizing or deifying that we saw for social media. We're now seeing the exact same thing for NFTs. And this is this is the discussion. Is it good? Is it bad? And the people who think it's good think it's really good because, you know, and you hear all the stories. I bought a house. I could pay for my mother's cancer treatment. I, uh, you know, I could pay for my diabetes medication, um, you know, uh, whatever the, the various stories um, that are, are real lives, people's real lives, as you say, Igor. But then on the other side, you have people who, who in the beginning of this, of this boom uh, a year ago, there were artists who I think probably would consider themselves not to be violent people um, who were sending death threats to other artists who were who were minting nfts saying no you're you're personally responsible for burning the planet and you know you and people like you are the ones who are you know destroying our civilization and our world and all of this kind of thing and you know i mean these that's exactly that's the level of or that's the part of the uh discourse that we're at and um you know i think in five years time it'll look very different and I like to think a lot about uh, what Ruth Catlow always says from Furtherfield in London. She says that um, she describes herself as a uh, as a recovery, recovering net utopian. And when she talks about uh, the way that she, so she does a lot of work in blockchain technologies. As far as I know, she hasn't yet minted an NFT, but um, she talks a lot about, you know, kind of occupying space. And when these technologies exist, um, they're not going to somehow unexist or become unexisted. So how do we occupy those spaces in ways that do something else other than, you know, sort of strengthen the narrative? And I would say that actually um, that same sort of ideology is probably one of the driving forces around why I don't make much networked art anymore I don't make much network performance anymore I work with the digital a lot you know it's a, it's a very intrinsic part of my working process and it's also an intrinsic part a, a sort of in, a very deeply rooted part of the content of my work but I don't make a lot of work that is ex exhibited on screens anymore it's not the central part of my practice and the reason for that is that I felt that you know it was no longer feasible to be critical of that machinery whilst using the mode that that machinery uses and so that's when I went in totally the opposite direction and started using you know kind of ancient modes in a way textiles and things embroidery things that are very very slow to do uh, and that was you know a, a very kind of uh, conscious choice um, and I think there's going to be more of that happening in the NFT space as well. And in all of the kind of web 3.0, as you say, Igor, like even if such a definition exists, but you know, it's, it's, it's cyclical. It seems to me to be cyclical anyway. Yeah. And actually yeah. Yeah, coming back to um, vulnerability and being in danger while exposed to the internet shorter or longer or actually also telecommunication online in 2011 or 2022 I find this really interesting if you had this conversation or tonight's conversation maybe three years ago uh, it would have still had maybe not such a current uh, um, aspect and as a demanding or maybe as a vulnerable aspect also because if I if you allow me to shift a little bit again into the idea of using the or, or talking or reflecting uh, towards maybe the, the end of our conversation and I, I, I see um, yeah more um, more uh, options for uh, participation here for the uh, for the for the audience but i just wanted to say maybe towards the end of our conversation tonight moving a little bit still to the the, the topic of online realities and uh, maybe uh, uh, although we maybe do not want to and cannot listen to the to this ongoing discourse of uh, <laughs> uh, online communication and 
and maybe um, soon in Europe, at least uh, um, reaching two years of pandemic uh, lives and um, seeing the chance and the curse at the same time to use the internet to communicate. The way that we come together tonight is only one. Uh, I, I think of maybe if I, if I can bring examples of, um, of, of my everyday life, I see certain uses, usages of internet. So on the one hand, um, maneuvering Adelbeter Berlin through the pandemic, we have found a, a, a series and really, at least I would say, me meaningful ways to have online conversations and even discussing research and reaching out internationally. So while not actually being able to open up locally, we actually reach out uh, um, uh, according certain allowing time zones and uh, arranging certain time zones to reach out globally. Um, and then just another aspect is a, um, a school child in times of pandemic, how, how far and how possible is it to, to, to let the child, I mean, according to certain ages, uh, participate in, in online realities. And uh, how, I think there is a whole way of creativity that we as adults are asked that we share with everyone and as much as we're technological and uh, um, allowed and also concerning the uh, internet access is the, the, the basis of everything. Um, um, so it's, I just wanted to bring this up that we have to look at all through hundreds of perspectives uh, nowadays when we think of online realities and uh, how much we can, how much we should uh, use. And I just actually see that uh, Sophia and Dan are with us, and uh, I would like to um, um, invite you to our um, platform here and to, to, to join the conversation, um, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would be really interested what they have to say, because I know that they don't use social media, so it would be fascinating to hear. Hi. From, from some Luddites. <laughs> Hi, Hi, good evening. <laughs> Hi, Sophia. Hi, Dan. Oh. Hello. Um, to have you with us. And maybe for the audience, if you allow me to just introduce Sophia and Dan, um, a, a really, really impressive artist duo known under the, um, the art group uh, Plan B. And uh, also uh, Plan B with Sophia New and Dan Velasco Roger Worth. Uh, you were present in our series of time and technology in 2011 and 12. And actually with your exhibition, you came directly after Greta, uh, also 10 years ago, basically. And uh, so actually, thank you for being here and uh, join the conversation. No, it's such, a, it's such a pleasure to hear you both talking about that and takes me back to the fact that I also met you just after that, Greta. So it was like yes. a whole world... And then, and then you left pretty, you weren't in Berlin much longer than you left and, and went, uh, uh, went out of Berlin. But uh, it's, it's, I was thinking a lot today, and now Dan's distracting, distracting me, please play. No, I'm the only one with no glasses, I'm very <laughs> left out. We're, we're going for partner look here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how, how do you guys find it working, navigating your career with, without, um, Social media. Well, you say career. It's sort of difficult. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we were about to do a course. I was thinking a lot about what you were talking about today because we we're about to do a course on uh, an attention and absorption. And I was got really interested recently on people like Julia Bell, who's written a book called Radical Attention, and mm. on um, How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell and mm. some other kind of thinking about what it is to, I was thinking when you were speaking now today, Greta, about digital detoxing and then how digital detoxing still brings you back in that rather difficult circle of making you more productive. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because it, it's the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, this idea of um oh what was there was a great article that came out about it a couple of years ago I think it was called they called it mick meditation or something <laughs> and it was this this idea that it was you know that um 
kind of wellness tools, including meditation and various other sort of presence type things have been sort of co-opted by the capitalist machine basically to uh, to be used as tools, both to not self-destruct in, in this kind of ultra anxiety inducing age, but also to remain and uh, to remain productive and maybe even increase your productivity during these times, you know, so that it, it becomes this sort of self-perpetuating thing that you have to spend all this time, you know, marketing yourself online, but then you need all these tools to sort of cope with that mentally uh, in order to be able to maintain your productivity at the same at the same time. And actually it's good, I think, that you mentioned attention because I had a note about that that I hadn't spoken to yet. You know, the note is, uh, you know, really, really well, well formulated. I'll read it out. It says, attention theft and capture in the age of the attention economy. <laughs> so, you know, take from that what you will. I've been talking for a while now, but... But yeah, I think it is interesting to reframe all of this, not in terms of, you know, the digital or, the, you know, kind of uh, evangelizing for various technologies or detoxing or sort of withdrawing from that, but just to think about it as a, as a, as a tension and where do we, where do we put our attention? What do we, yeah, how is it, how is it being kind of co-opted and manipulated, right? Yeah, I think also, I just wanted to say to you, but well all of all of you that uh, in a way I feel um a bit strange I have to say because when we first said the thought we're not going to do Facebook we're not going to do you know MySpace do you remember that um <laughs> we're not going to do any of that so we've never been involved in any of these things I had this naive thought it'll blow over <laughs> right? but, <laughs> you, no one will do it and yeah, I, no, I, but it sort of did, Dan. It sort of did. Look, yeah, Facebook is dead. You say that. No. I, I want to be on Mastodon, right? Because I'm a good open source person and, mm -hmm. you know, digital vegan and all this. Mm -hmm. um, I have no idea how to do it. I haven't spent the last 10 years, like yeah. you and Igor and everybody else, getting my kind of Twitter chops in. I, <laughs> I, I can't read the emojis. I don't know what all of the ac and ac acronyms are. Yeah. I don't know anything. Of, and I'm like blundering about this thing <laughs> like, a, like an idiot. And everybody knows I'm an idiot. And it's really like I've, I've really, I feel like someone that just hasn't been in the, in the social spaces that everybody else has been in for the last. It's true. I mean, there is, there has been a real sort of, I mean, it's not true that you're blundering. I have no idea how your performance, because <laughs> that wasn't an evaluation. <laughs> but um, no, it's true that there definitely has been a sort of um, mutual collaborative encoding of culture online, you know? I mean, there are, uh, and I, I think that there, there's not just one right way. Obviously, there are different ways, but I mean, you know, there are sort of accepted meaning meanings for various emojis that maybe only marginally have to do with the actual thing that's depicted by the emoji, you know? So I think we are sort of progressing towards emojis as hieroglyphics in some sort of way that, you know, carry more meaning, which, I mean, is fascinating from a sort of anthropological standpoint, right? But- um, I mean, you, you made this comment as well very early on before we got started about that's, that's why you have children so they can explain things to you. <laughs> Yes, that's right. Interpreters. <laughs> <laughs> of the next digital world. And the other thing that's haunting me, Greta, I have to admit, is this um, comment that you made about at the end of this project, I mean, okay, I'm paraphrasing and you can correct me and, and say it more articulately, but it was like there was this dopamine of like feeling love from the attention, but at the same time knowing that your mental health had deteriorated. And I feel like that absolutely relates to where we are now. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that, and exactly. And so, you know, at the time, I just had these, these two, uh, what are the, you know, they're kind of, they're measures that you do. They're, they're sort of for, uh, forms that you fill out and then they get scored in a certain way. And um, it was quite clear that my mental health had deteriorated after the performance. Um, and that was just, you know, a sort of part of, that was just a fact, a finding that came out of the performance. And the other thing that I, that I wrote, that I said earlier at the beginning about dopamine, you know, that's something more that I'm seeing from the context, from the point of view now of, of what we know now. I mean, there, those kind of studies, I think, haven't 
I mean, I certainly wasn't aware of studies like that having been done in 2011. You know, I think that's something that's come up since then, that they've actually been able to measure the, the dopamine hits that you get from uh, notifications coming in and things like that. And I think there was somewhere else here, there was a note that I wrote about, you know, this kind of uh, interaction between the digital and and psychology because I was definitely at the time looking at it from the point of view of how is the digital, how is this development in technology affecting our psychology both individually and kind of societally. But what's become increasingly clear over the intervening 10 years is that it also works the other way. You know, there's there are so many um, psych tools psychologists testing, you know, being used consciously by the big platforms to impact us, you know, um, and that there's there's a lot of effort and funding and research being put into how to manipulate attention, how to manipulate users, how to manip manipulate their psychology in order to keep them on board. So, and that's why we end up in this sort of bizarre um, Zwickmühle, you know, this bizarre kind of uh, catch between, um, I think most people these days, maybe not, yeah, I mean, very many people, if not most, I've, I've heard acknowledge that they know that when they spend too much time on social media, it doesn't do their mental health any good, but they also can't really step outside of it completely. And I think there are numerous reasons for that. You know, there's the kind of social and, and professional pressure that exists for very many people, but then it's also, you know, the kind of uh, the psychological mechanisms that are being actively employed, you know, purposely employed and kind of uh, directed at us. So, yeah. Which is why, you know, when I think about where this kind of started, that idea about demonizing and deifying, is it good or bad, this kind of thing, it, it, it feels so, those questions feel so irrelevant now, you know, um, because it, it feels so inescapable in a way. I mean, it, it would be like, I don't know, debating the autobahn system or something like that, you know, I mean, these things just exist, don't they? I mean, we do still debate them, right? Like speed limits and things like that. And I think, you know, we kind of debate these little tweaks, but the sort of fundamental infrastructure exists and we sort of seem to take that for granted. It's, it seems very difficult for us to uh, kind of reimagine things from the ground up. At the same time, I mean, I think there's been a huge insurgence and I think you just said it just now, the keyword of, of getting outside, like the you know, everyone's been trapped in this screen world for so long that, you know, the amount of dogs that people have <laughs> suddenly brought into their lives in order to take a walk, in order to have a reason to go out, in order to escape the two dimensional and even just train our eyes to look beyond the screens that we all stare at all day has become in very important. And I think- Yeah, that but, then, but then people just post about them online anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly all. I mean, yeah. I mean, if I wanted to be cynical about it, I would say that it becomes a kind of, you know, it becomes a form of um, social media cachet, or it can be. Um, but, you know, uh, I'm not a cynical person by nature. So, you know, I think in general, you know, it, people want to share that, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of instances of people talking on, whether it be Twitter or wherever, who, you know, say something along the lines of like, oh, I'm having a bad day, send dog pics or something. And then people do, they send just pictures of their pets and things. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's become also a shorthand, actually going back to what you said, Chris, um, for solidarity in some way or for some sort of form of um, care, right? That you would send pictures of your pets to cheer people up. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I see it in some way um, working, well, obviously it's, it's very kind of closely enmeshed with the larger capitalist system, but I see it working in a similar way. And I remember writing something, I don't think it ever got published actually, because I couldn't quite make it sound smart enough, but um, 
but a few years ago and I was thinking about the way that uh, you know capitalist systems uh, are able to basically absorb and appropriate any sort of criticism that gets leveled against them so you know and, and the example that I was using of that was um, were like uh, health food type things you know organic food things like that that there was this kind of uh, movement that had been you know over several decades like gaining strength where people were saying you know we reject this kind of industrially grown food we want food that's you know grown in this natural way and it's healthier blah 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 and what what did that result in I mean it resulted in like the McDonald's McBio burger or something right like it it results in the highest kind of most power central elements of the capitalist network like hearing the criticism absorbing the criticism appropriating the criticism and selling it back to the people and you know in some ways it, it sort of feels like um social media platforms even though they do rise and fall so it is true what you say Dan that you know Facebook will blow over I, I do believe that but it will it won't blow over and then it'll go back to the way it was before I mean it'll, it'll blow over and then there'll be you know discord or whatever it is um but yeah it does feel like those they, they reach a sort of certain size where uh they're kind of self-perpetuating in some way and, and they become able to just um, absorb any sort of criticism or any kind of uh, attacks and actually it, it makes them more powerful. I don't, I don't know. That's how it feels to me. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe these are late night ramblings, but. I think that's as good a point as any to end it in uh, in early 2022 after two years of the pandemic. Um, I mean, I would say we've done lots of things offline, um, less in the last two years than usual, but also quite a few. Everything from critical engineering to uh, uh, walks along the river. And uh, we'll be going on this year to be doing a series of of uh, workshops offline and uh, getting people's hands dirty and wet and everything. Uh, uh, we're working together to build community. So, uh, you know, you can watch our, uh, keep on in touch with us and see what we're up to. And I'm sure that uh, you have a lot of things also upcoming as well. So. Yes, me? Oh, absolutely. And yes, I thank you for that, Chris. I'm, I'm not hopeless. I think that there are amazing things happening in the world, in the real world. Yeah. Well, actually, as, as much as I also want to um, thank uh, Greta and Igor and also Sophia, Dan, thank you for joining. Um, we can here stay in that round, please, for a little more. But I just maybe wanted to also say thank you to the audience who joined us tonight. Uh, and very enduringly yes. and um, we want to uh, as always invite you for further events online and offline and on site and virtually and um, um, we will announce soon that uh, Tuche, Tuche Erel and me we have new discursive formats coming up a uh, colloquium and a reading club so actually um, online and offline, <laughs> on-site and offline. And uh, on, um, so we are gonna um, announce this uh, soon. And uh, thank you very much for attending here as much as uh, you were here um, putting some questions to the, to the speakers. If you want to further uh, investigate the project, please uh, visit our website, which is really a little bit like an archive of sorts. And as well as the time and technology series is also very much uh, digged up and, and well uh, documented. And even dear audience, if you wanted to know more uh, about the artists, feel free to contact us and we're very happy to uh, lead on the questions and the comments. And uh, as always at the very end, uh, we wanted to wish everyone all the best, stay safe and sound. See you soon.